Tony, uh, he was the man who, uh, Tony Power is the man who introduced um, uh, Paul Raymond to pornography, really, uh, and uh, he sort of sold him the idea of men only as a magazine, and that was the start of Paul Raymond's massive porn publishing empire, which made him um, multi-millionaire. Uh, and uh, he, Tony himself, was a uh, uh, huge drug head, massive coke head, uh, drank an awful lot. Just a really, he was a really talented journalist or you know editor uh, who um, I think was just excited about where he was. Um, lived a good life, absolutely, uh, one hundred percent. And then um, very sadly died, as so often happens to people like that, died uh, in a in a fire. Um, he set himself on fire essentially with a. He fell asleep, stoned, pissed, fell asleep with a cigarette, and his flat went on fire, and he died. But he before that he'd been fired by Paul Raymond for just being too way out there. Well, what attracted me to the role was. Uh, uh, so Steve Coogan and Michael Winterbottom are making a film, okay, I d that, you don't really need to hear any more than that, you don't need to hear what the film is or what the role is, just yes, please, yes, I'll do that. Well, um, in terms of researching the porn of the time, um, I spent most of my adolescence researching it, uh, so I felt very, very... Um, yeah, very, very clued up about that. However, um, there's not that much... Um, Information about Tony Power himself, he's one of those people who sort of slipped through the internet. He's, um, he's not uh, a big enough name uh, for, for, to have been, you know, for someone to have gone back and recorded his deeds and life. Um, you know, now, he'd be all over the internet because everybody's all over the internet. Um, but he, he, yeah, so there's, there's not that much stuff. So it's been very odd, actually, uh, playing him. The beard and the hair, oh god, the beard and the hair, I mean they do look amazing but it takes the best part of two hours every, every morning to get into this and, um, and, but, and I can't do, there's some things that I can't do, if I laugh too hard the moustache goes doink and, uh, and I find that I can't eat, I can't eat, I have to sort of eat tubular things, I can only eat things of a certain <laughs> So it's like, you know that game at the fairground where you've got to take a, a sort of, uh, there's, a, there's a bent metal wire and you have to not buzz as you take a hoop around it. Yeah, it's, it's like that with eating. I, kind of have to, it's only, I can only go that far with my mouth. So anything, basically I'm living off Pepper Army. That's essentially the only, uh, Pepper Army is the only thing I can eat. I prefer filming. In, when it's not restricted, uh, you know, when it's all about um, the action being semi-improvised or improvised, or there's more of an energy there. It's more exciting, uh, and you get a lot. You get a lot more, I think, out of out of the actors that way because they're not concentrating on things that that uh, are, are distracting their attention. If you've got a setup where you do have to hit a mark and you do have to stay in a particular. Uh, you know, frame and you can't go out of it. It's really hard to do that and then turn on whatever it is that you're supposed to do. But here, if you've got, if you're able to just, um, if you're able to just be, you know, do the bit, talk to the person and not worry about where, which way you're pointing and all those kinds of things, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a much nicer way to work. It's less stressful um, and I think you get better results really. It's really strange to, to start to work with people that you've admired for, well, actually 20 years. Um, but he is, he's brilliant to work with because he's always thinking, he's always, um, he's always refining what it is that he's doing. Um, this morning's uh, uh, scene was, is a really good example. You know, he was standing there as, as Paul making uh, a speech um, about his daughter at her wedding. And you could see him between each take figuring out uh, another little bit that he could add or a way of swapping stuff around or mannerism that would that would make more sense um, until you know by, by you know by by the final take it was just this is absolutely perfect he's the the in my experience the the best people are the people who don't go oh that'll do you know, or I've done it that way, so, so now that I've established that, uh, I can take the excuse not to have to work on this anymore. I can just do the same thing over and over again. And Steve's really, really good at, at just teasing out every bit of, um, 
there's, there's something in that. Let's find what's in that. And that, I really like that. That's, that's what he has in common with um, Armando Iannucci, and that's why they work so well on Partridge together, I think, is that that's their, that's their way of being. Well, Paul Rayner's story is fascinating because, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because he became England's richest man, right, off the back of, you know, essentially pornography in the end, that's what it was, pornography and, and um, which allowed him to buy Soho, allowed him to become this incredible property magnate. He was worth a billion and a half by the time he died four years ago. Um, and that's fascinating, that idea that in, in a country that's still quite hidebound about that kind of thing and really doesn't approve of the idea, the richest man in the country made his money from sex. Um, and as sex, which we don't approve of, and buildings, buying property, which we absolutely bloody do approve of, and, you know, some of us would like to do a bit more of, etc., etc. You know, it's the two fantastically English things.